we're in transaction two right now, okay? So what I will say to you all regarding transaction I'm two look at this at stage. Your, uh, transactions, I haven't, you know, had a chance to really dig down deep into them yet. But we're still carrying on now, okay? The transaction still goes on. And so now we're going to deal with all ten of our sections at this point. And so that is going to add in your terminations, what we call, for the most part, your in-game type of sections. Your uh, termination, your remedies, your indemnities and remedies. And then we're gonna, today we're gonna talk about the general provisions, okay? <clears throat> I kind of wanted to <laughs> cram it all in but I can't. I, I tried and I have, I don't teach this class the same way every single time. I teach this class based on the questions that I get from the exit ticket. So that steers me and tells me what I need to spend time on. And so I just, there's no way that I can get the terminations, the indemnity and remedies in because I would like to do that so that thinking that the ones of you whose brain is not mush, you would over the over the break kind of work on the transaction. So what I'm saying to you is, you know, don't just throw it in the closet. Okay, you're gonna have time over this. Okay, <laughs> don't go to the beach the whole time. I mean, try to work on it a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so because we're still moving through this process and you don't want to get behind when you have to add those those next sections on. So we're going to start talking about your general provisions. If I were you, I would kind of work on the general provisions. You see what I'm saying? Over the over the break, you know, that way, because the terminations is going to be the terminations and the indemnity and remedies, that's going to it, it can be a little challenging for students. OK, so I want to try to put that in uh, the the atmosphere. Also, um, you know, I as much as possible, I want you all to do your business issues worksheet. I want you to get in the habit of then consolidating as much information as possible into a deal memo. And I, I kind of got the impression that maybe some people did not do that. But what I want you to do is to look ahead. I, I don't hide the ball. Look ahead on your homework because I am go it's going to be assigned the deal memo for transaction two. Okay, so I'm going to want to look at it because what I found is that, you know, you, it, it's too tricky to try to get the terminations, your indemnity and remedies without having some things, uh, some of your uh, analysis synthesized, okay? And so for me to try to just say to students, okay, I want you to do a deal memo, I want you to do a deal memo, and then expect that you're actually gonna do it. I'm sorry, but it seems that I have to assign something and so, because once I start to look at your transactions, the first draft, um, then what I start to find when you start moving into the second draft is that the foundation has not been laid. And so I really want you to think about going back into that transaction now and seeing if you can go back in there. If there are some things that are not on your business issues worksheet or if you feel like you could do better with a deal memo, start formulating that. You're going to need it, okay? And so uh, so we're going to move in today our general provisions. Uh, that's what I want to end up talking about. But there were some questions, and so I want to go through some things once again and then move into the general provisions discussion for this evening. And of course, you know I'm gonna be using one of my transaction figures tonight. I'm gonna talk a lot about Ralph's deal again. Um, and so again, you know, here is, that is the deal memo for uh, Ralph's deal. 
that I'm hoping that everybody is familiar with and that you are, uh, you know, getting as much out of the uh, moving towards understanding how to uh, give the client, uh, meet the client's business goals, okay? And again, uh, you know, it can be like a broken record, but we're talking about the seven contract concepts, five issues of client concern, and 10 contract sections. This is how we uh, put this all together. And definitely 10, 10, 10 contract sections. So, and they have to be set out just like this in your agreement, okay? And you have to be responsible for making sure that whatever needs to go in the right place is in the right place. And now, what I am still finding is that people are wanting to rely on that sample, but what you need to realize is that these are our sections. Your sample is not broken down into these sections. So you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. You really don't need that, that sample. Uh, and I want you to try to think about moving away from even needing to use it uh, because I can see, a, you know, a little confusion that comes from trying to make this deal or any other deal that we're working on fit the facts of a, a sample that you're trying to use. It, it just does not relate in many respects. And so that's sometimes where the, uh, a lot of confusion can come in. And so again, the first thing that I do is I set up my format. Cause see in the end, when I'm rushing and I'm trying to meet that deadline, one thing I do know is I'm gonna have all these sections in here cause that's what the instructions told me to do. So at least, and so if something's missing, I'm gonna be able to say, well, there's a big hole right here. I need, what's, what goes here? And so at least I know I will have each one of my 10 sections, okay? And so, I think I, I was trying to help you all the last time by showing you this document map, <laughs> but this is not how your agreement is going to be looking. Okay, I uh, saw where somebody was, what I'm saying here in your subject matter performance provision, that is what, what, that is what Article 3.0 has to have in it. I don't want to see two separate provisions that say subject matter performance provision because that's this is just trying to show you that in that one provision you need to have the covenant slash obligation for the one party on the one hand and the other one on the other hand it is just giving you a document map telling you what you need to have in that provision based on what we've talked about in class and so that is what that what what this is. But what I found about this class is like whack-a-mole. Once I feel like I walked out of here and I've gotten some confusion out of the air, it's, it's like something else. It's like I'll walk out of here and I'll be like, Phew, I got it. And then I will get back to my office and I'll read the exit tickets and I'll be like, oh, dang. <laughs> I forgot to say this or I forgot to say that or I may have created some confusion somewhere but this is a very technical I mean it's just you know it's just that it's just the nature of the beast and so that's why I say to you follow these step-by-step -step instructions uh, and then you can because it's you know it's not like a Bible or you know so it's not so you know it's a style thing in some respects but until you understand what some things mean I you would want to follow some of the instructions that we uh, talked about in the class and so <clears throat> we have our seven contract concepts and uh, we have our five issues of client concern, okay? And so what we do, uh, we look at our client goals and find out what business issues 
uh, result from those client goals. <clears throat> and then we're going to use our concepts to solve those business issues slash problems because that's what these are. <clears throat> problems. And so as I have asked or I have suggested to you that you have to use your business issues worksheet to see the problems, okay? Uh, it just gives you a good way of being able to see the problems. Now, I'm not gonna go through every single step like I have in the past, because I really need to get to those general provisions, but there were some questions that I would want to uh, spend some time on. So. I'm going to go straight into, I'm not even going to deal with Article 1. I'm hoping that we got that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the definitions uh, this evening because we had some uh, definitions that we uh, had left over from the last class. And so we always, when we get into that Section 2 or Article 2, the definitions, I always say just start with boom, 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 those first four. Define the agreement so that throughout now we can t we can call it the agreement and when we call it the agreement we know what we're talking about because we have defined it. It is this license agreement. Then we define the parties so that now from this point on we are going to be able to refer to that party as such and when we so once we refer, once we define the party as such, then you got to make up your mind because it's not going to be licensor or licensee. I, you cannot, if you're going to call it licensor, then that's what you need to call it. So, but that creates a lot of confusion when you define it, Ralph LP, then you start talking about licensor. So that's the whole point of defining at this point. And then we want to define that thing that the agreement is about. And then after I do that, then I'm going to go to my business issues worksheet. I have already put it on my business, so I'm going straight to all of my places where I have section two definitions. And I'm looking for the next definitions that I need to put into the definition section. Now, there are some people who may like for style purposes to have those definitions in alphabetical order. You know, later on, okay, once you get this process down, okay, you have all your definitions, and you go back and you say, okay, I got all my definitions set, then you can go back if you like the, the alphabetical order, you put them in alphabetical order. But you have to have a process of being able to have definitions that are critical to the client's goals. Not just definitions for the sake of having definitions. All nice and pretty in alphabetical order. If there are definitions that are not relevant to anything, then why have them? So this is all about analysis now, okay? So I need to be defining things that are critical to furthering the client's goal. <clears throat> and so, uh, I know I need to, for me, I, wanna, I want to define Ralph trademark image because I don't want to call it likeness. It's a trademark image is what we're doing. We're licensing the right, and that, that's how you keep yourself on track with having a deep understanding of the client's business goals and what the client is trying to do. When I see a person trying to take a purchase and sale agreement sample and apply it to this agreement, you find yourself trying to say that Ralph is selling something when he's not. He's not, this is not a purchase sale agreement. So it's not gonna work to use that purchase sale sample. So I'm seeing all throughout that there's a lot of confusion in your provisions because instead of using a business issues worksheet, to draft the agreement based on the client's goals, you're trying to kind of plug in, change the names and make it fit a stove deal or another sample. 
So don't do that. If you can resist the urge to do that, I want you to think about getting into the habit of using this business issue worksheet. And so licensed territory can mean more than one thing in this agreement based on the client's goal. It will mean Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont for the first year. And the second year is going to be based on sales. So I have to have an either or scenario here. And so I want to make sure that I remind you all that there are no electronic devices used during this class. I want to make sure I keep reminding you of that. Okay. All right. So it's either Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont for the second and third years of the license only if it's a condition in that definition, only if merchandise and sales for the first year of the license term are equal to or less than $7 million. If the sales are less than $7 million, this is going to be the territory for the second and third years. So we have to follow the client's goal. We can't just make it what we want it to be. Or Delaware, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont for the second and third years of the license term, but only if merchandise is sell for the first year of the license term exceeds $7 million. Okay. All right. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, can, can we, ref we cross-reference a section in the conditions section? So if we were to say uh, in the second and third years, subject to the conditions in section 3.1. No. Mm, no, I don't want, no, we don't want to do that because this is definition. Okay. See, you have to define it first because, first of all, this is not necessarily a covenant. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it, this, right, this point, we have to define this first. There may be some later covenant obligation that may flow from this, but you have to define it. And for this, this is where you would want this in the definitions. This definition. <laughs> okay. So that's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, I don't, you, if you're going to define it, you don't want to be the one to have to go rummaging. This is the definition. See, this is a place where I want to define it. I want to make it clear right here. I don't want to have to now go running around to figure out what this means because this is because this is the place to define what something means well, we also reiterate it down the conditions to the, the obligation? you may reiterate it to the extent that you may talk about it when you say the conditions well, what do you mean well, it's conditions to obligations or or conditions to but you you make it seem like there's a section for it i mean you can have conditions to obligations where in the where action section the, uh, it wouldn't be in the actions. Where would it be so mostly? That would be in the business Maybe provisions. in the business provision somewhere. But only to the extent that you're saying something and you're referencing licensed territory, you're saying if there's some kind of obligation, you're saying such, 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 such shall uh, do whatever pursuant to, the, you know, in this licensed territory, then now I know what you mean when you say licensed territory, then I have to then go and determine, okay, you know, what provision you are referring to in that business, whatever that obligation is. So let's say the licensed territory, Ralph uh, will, because he's got to end all the other contracts in the territory. Ralph he has will, to do what? Say that again. Uh, he has to end all the other contracts. In, the, in Vermont, in New Hampshire, uh, yeah. in Maine, in the second and third years. He has to, okay. he has to terminate all the contracts. Terminate? Any contracts that he has. Who? Ralph does. 
in, 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 the, in the agreement, if, if um, merchandisers hit $7 million, uh -huh. Ralph has agreed that he's going to terminate any other contracts he has in Ralph in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Uh, in the second thirty years. Well, okay. I would just I wouldn't get ahead. Well, he he would have to, but, but that goes okay. Down in the business okay, division. yeah. If you Long, wanna, Long yeah. Long okay, but you're really advocating for merchandises more at that point, which and has our business has our clients' business goals asked us to do that. That's what you have to ask yourself. Yeah, because it benefits them for merchandisers to expand into Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. So that he, Ralph wants them to expand. He may want them to expand, expand, but it's not necessary that for his goals that he has to have an obligation to terminate any other reason. You see what I'm saying? That's more advocating for merchandisers. When our client has not, he's asked us to do some things that may benefit merchandisers, but that's not one of them. So, so without the advocating that part, the substance isn't as much my question as we have this defined here, but it also has to be, it also has to go in the business provisions that, that they have an agreement that in the second or third year that they're going to expand the territory now. Oh, it, it can't just go in the definitions, I guess is my point, because they're not binding, they're not legally binding. It's got to go somewhere in the provisions that they're going to bind these two parties. Yes, yes, I'm just saying, all I'm saying to you is, all I'm going to do, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to let merchandisers advocate for, for merchandisers. Right now, I'm just going to deal with the business goals that the client has asked me to deal with in the deal memo. I'm not saying there will be anything wrong with what you're saying. I'm dealing with my bit because I got too much to deal with, quite frankly. So I'm not saying that's either wrong or right, but what I am dealing primarily with here, I want you to stay focused on the client's goals. And that way, it, see, that's what I can see. You know, you have, we, this is, whole thing is about keeping a line item focus on what the client has asked us to do. And then everything else is extra, but let's get down what we need to get down first. Because you know, we have so many things that we need to, to do. So that's an excellent point, but the fact of the matter is right now I need to get this definition down and if there is something that I need to uh, some provision that needs to kick this definition into action, so to speak, uh, down in the business provisions or somewhere else later on, then all I am saying is anybody would know what we mean because they can come here and know based on the facts, the factual scenario of whatever's going on in the life of the agreement, if it's the second year or the first year, it, the term would be based on the, the sales. Uh, so, those are all excellent points. And then uh, we talked about net sales and net worth. And so we uh, did some uh, definitions of those as well. Uh, this is, uh, you know, more. It, there, there was not necessarily anything specific that the client really stated uh, about the uh, net sales or the net worth. And so what I am just putting here are just some thoughts in my mind that would uh, be more beneficial to the client. You know, some people will try to use their accounts receivables as assets. Well, we don't want to do that here, uh, merchandisers. If somebody hasn't paid you, that, that's not going to be calculated in my mind in your assets when you are going to calculate your net worth. Uh, so that is just, and then I, you want to be clear on when it's calculated. I, I really, we really should be January 14th through January 13th, so we'll have a cutoff. But you want there to be 
The reason I'm saying that is because when you draft an agreement, if you don't make it plain, other people, they'll think you, one, peop, one person will think the other one knew when the other one didn't know, and when it comes right down to it, it's not what either one thought it should be because it's not clear. So you can't just, just say, you know, you can't use just a random, you know, uh, uh, definition that you may find in a sample somewhere. You have to think about the client's goal, what the client is trying to do. <clears throat> Uh, the client has asked uh, that merchandisers create samples before uh, it can merchandise or, or manufacture any uh, of the items that they're going to be selling. So maybe that might be something that would be calculated in net sales as a deduction. Or uh, so for me, I just like to keep it simple put everything in there and just let it all be 10% for me. Or somebody else can have another calculation, but you have to have a way of calculating it so that once the time comes to get the money, there won't be any surprises. That it won't be, you find out that after they deduct uh, all of the deductions that it turns out to be 30% this month and 50 next month. And so then, those are my definitions so far. But who knows, I'm not finished with this agreement yet. As I go on, I may need some more definitions. And so, And so I just use my business issues worksheet to guide me in my uh, thinking about uh, definitions, uh, net worth, and so on and so forth, whatever they may be. <clears throat> and so then I want to look a little bit uh, at the business action section. And this is that document map again that I had up. And these are just things to think about just to make sure as you're going through that you have that checklist for some of these provisions. Some of these are things that I see are missing. And so I am just trying as much as I can to um, alert students to some of the things that they need to have in uh, some of these provisions because uh, some of them are just missing uh, sometimes when I'm looking at some of the uh, agreements. Uh, so. so again, uh, we have our business issues worksheet. It's showing me where my uh, subject matter performance provision uh, items will be, uh, Ralph will grant merchandisers the, la the license for caps and t-shirts. And so this is telling me what type, of, what type of promise I need for that part of the subject matter performance provision. And then over here, I have merchandisers obligations. In many respects, I am finding still that uh, some people are missing the obligation to pay money to uh, Ralph LP uh, as an obligation of merchandisers in that subject matter performance provision. Even though you have a payment provision, why would I want to put that also in my subject matter performance provision? Anybody? I'm going to come back to that question. I'm not going to spend a long time on it, but I'm hoping that somebody, I want you to start to um, 
develop your own reasoning and thinking skills now. Uh, everything in this agreement is tied to that subject matter performance provision. A lot of things are. It is really the base of the agreement. And so as much as I can, uh, there's the most important things, which is payment. There are some things I want to sneak into that subject matter performance provision. And so the merchandising, the marketing uh, of the caps and t-shirts is important, but I also want to make sure that I make it clear that, uh, that merchandisers' main obligation as well is to pay the royalty. That's what the whole agreement is that all about. That payment provision that you are making sure that you are asking yourself, pay what to who, how, and when. Don't forget that. Uh, you want to go back and ask yourself, okay, how is the client going to get paid? You know, when is the client going to get paid? Uh, uh, you you want to look at as much as possible what is going to be in the best interest of uh, the client. Uh, now, it may be that uh, you may want to try to wait until the end of the first year for uh, Ralph to get paid for the first time. I find it unattainable in this type of agreement. I would not want to wait until the end of the, uh, the <laughs> I mean, I'm going to go a whole year, then realize that Ralph, uh, that merchandisers is not doing everything it can do to, mar to merchandise and market. So I uh, want to probably try to maybe think about uh, how that affects the client in the particular agreement. <clears throat> and so also in those action provisions, uh, we have the term, the closing date, and again, th those deliveries. And so it may be that uh, the particular type of agreement does not have a particular closing date, but uh, I still want you to be in the habit of including some type of deliveries to keep you on track. Because in the end, when time comes to figure out your exhibits, then you already have them. I always like to start out with uh, deliveries are not like things you're going to pick up and bring. They are the consideration, the documents that are uh, attributable to the consideration that uh, it that is related to the main purpose of the agreement. And so uh, let's see here. On or before the date of his execution of this of this agreement, merchandise shall deliver to Ralph LP. What was that thing that Ralph was so interested in? The financial statements. How can you have an agreement that does not have that as an exhibit? Well, the whole agreement is about the right to use the trademark image. Yes, ma'am. That's fine. Exhibit one, whatever you want to call them. I, exhibit A, say that again. Oh, so that's why I'm saying to include it here, because then once you put it here, then when the time comes to my exhibit, all I'm going to do is just take this and say at the end, with exhibit A, this is my exhibit A, merchandise financial statement. Yeah. I am saying, I'm trying to give you a way to, you know, have a machine. I do this the same way every single time. So when I get ready to go to my exhibits, I'm just going to go back up to the top and do my checklist. Say, okay, where are my exhibits? 
when I get to my exhibits, it's going to be a big blank hole there. So I know I need to put something there. So then I'm going to go back up here and I, and I already have it situated here in order. So yes, definitely. And however it is that you do, you may want to do exhibit one and some, some people like to do something else. Yes, ma'am. Can you have an exhibit that is not listed in the deliveries but is listed? Absolutely. Yes. However, let me tell you about the deliveries though. See, my, when I'm thinking about the deliveries, the deliveries are that thing that, that is tied to the consideration. It could be the bill of sale. You see what I'm saying? That's what I'm looking for. When I'm looking at your deliveries, I'm looking to see, do you understand this deal? What's important to this or that person? Merchandisers don't want to walk out without something that shows, something from the Patent and Trademark Office that shows that Ralph has the right to this trademark image. Or there are some, you know, patents and trademarks, copyrights, things that are not registered. If that's what he's trying to do, whatever, a certified copy or whatever it is that's giving you ownership, that you think you have ownership rights in this, that you are now giving me the right to use. So I'm looking for those things. Now, what else? is going to be important here. That thing that I'm always talking about. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm always looking for something about money. Money, money, money. Cause that's what this thing is all about. Actually, <laughs> that could be exhibit A, right? <laughs> Quite frankly, for me, I could start right there. So I want to have all of my exhibits together and this is a good place to have that formulation to start thinking about that. Anyway. Let's see if I can find it. I hope I Maybe I, maybe, maybe I didn't put my deliveries. Okay. So now look, cause see, I'm thinking as I'm going, you know, I, all the time I'm thinking, okay, how can I, okay, what's going to happen if I do, if I do, okay. On or before the date of the execute of this execution of this agreement, Ralph L. P. shall deliver to merchandise a certified co a copy of his registered trademark, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. On or before the date of execution of this agreement, merchandise shall deliver to Ralph L. P. Sign certification of establishment. Need you to get the account set up. So where you gonna put my royalty payment? I want I want to make sure you got the routing numbers and all that correct. Establishment of the payment of the royalty bank transfer procedure with appropriate. Ralph LP and Merchandisers Banking Institution, as well as a signed certification of his understanding of the payment of royalty schedule. Okay. And so somebody asked me about schedules and difference between schedules, and if there's really no difference, the fact of the matter is this is where section 10 is where I'm going to put all of my schedules and exhibits. A schedule is also going to be an exhibit. The schedule of payments, whatever that may be. Some people may want to do, I just, for me, quite frankly, I don't see how it can further the business goals to have payments, yearly payments, but I'm not going to, you know, it's just, a, that could be a style thing as well. But the payment of royalty schedule. The signed cert cert uh, certification of establishment of payment of the royalty bank transfer procedure 
and a signed certification of understanding of the payment of royalty schedule, all of this is gonna be in Exhibit B. So when I go there, that's what I'm gonna be looking for. And so when you go to my, my Exhibit B, that's what you're gonna see. All of those things are gonna be behind my Exhibit B. Everything to do with my, mon my money. So now when the time comes for the first payment and there seems to be some confusion, I can just send a little notice and say, oh, hey, Mr. Merchandisers, did you forget? Pursuant to Exhibit B, pursuant to uh, articles such and such and such and such, and also Exhibit B, see, this is a schedule. You signed, you understand. You got my bank routing number so that there is no uh, confusion. Okay. And so that is then going to take me to, this, is, this was the question that I just answered. Can we go over the discrete uh, exhibit and schedule? There's no real, uh, you know, an exhibit, you know, it's just, it can be, it can even, it doesn't have to be things that are deliveries. When I'm looking at your deliveries, I mean, your exhibits, the first thing I want to see are the ones that are specified in your deliveries okay because that's the main consideration that's what that should represent if you have other exhibits so be it Ex put those in there but put them after your i'm looking for a b and c one two and three whatever they are one two three four i'm looking for those ones first because they are tied to the consideration the bill of sale whatever it could be a receipt uh, showing reflecting payment, you know, these types of things. <clears throat> and so then uh, we continue on with those business sections. I'm looking in my uh, business issues worksheet tells me that, you know, I need some type of obligation regarding net worth. I know what net worth is now. I know how it will be calculated to get to this $15 million. So that, I don't know, maybe answers a question that we had earlier because you see how uh, where is it? How you would, whatever your obligation is regarding that net worth would be in your business provisions when the actual definition itself, how to calculate it, would be in your uh, definitions. And so then after those business and action sections, then we go into our representations and warranties. And now, well, again, we have to follow uh, those things that were given to us in our deal. Uh, can we go over forming a representation and warranty more? Okay, so this is what I want to say about representation and warranties, forming them. They should be formed from your business issues worksheet. Now, uh, 
we're just practicing. So when I see people, uh, they're just using plain language. I kind of like that, you know. It, you you want to if you want to get into some fancy legalese later on, that's fine. But just understand what the representation and warranties are first, so that you can make sure that you have all of them reflected. Uh, in this past week's assignment, I did not see all of the ones that we are needing to have. When you see words like reliance, that's I means somebody's relying on a representation. So I know that's going to be my representation and warranty. Ralph wants the contract to reflect its reliance on the financial statements. Okay, so I'm going to need a representation and warranties about those financial statements. So I'm going through my business issue worksheet. I'm going through, I'm looking, I'm not having to necessarily, once I do the work, to form them because they are formed for me. Assurance. When I see words like relied on, assurance, those are people, those are representation warranty words. So our client in this respect, you see earlier, you know, when I was saying you're advocating on the behalf of the client, if the client's goals, the client's telling us to do that, then that's what we need to do. Here, the client is saying merchandisers want some kind of assurance. The client's telling us they want us to put that in the contract. Focus on the client goals first. Merchandisers want some kind of assurance in the contract, A, that Ralph LP actually owns what it is licensing. So I'm going to need a representation and warranties from uh, Ralph LP about that. Now, then there are some things B, that during the term of the license, well, can that be a representation? He will do something. No. That's going to be what concept? Your covenant. Okay. So I can see later on, I might need that's going to probably be somewhere else. So I'm looking for representation and warranties. I'm stay, I need to stay focused on my representation and warranty section because that's what I'm working on. Okay. Assurances. Merchandisers wants Ralph LP to give assurances that merchandisers is the only one now with the right to sell trademark caps and t-shirts in its territory. Is this what you were talking about? No. no. Okay. Yeah. See, so let's stay focused on just what we've been asked to do. See? This let's just deal with this representation and warranty. Okay. So there are two things that Ralph wants. He wants to have an assurance that Ralph owns it owns the thing he's licensing and that he hasn't given somebody else the right to use it while merchandisers is using it because that's a lawsuit and see somebody was asking me early 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 on in the class if we need to break up the yes because see how one can be a representation and warranty, and then this other one that during during the term, then that means that can't be because that's something that's happening, that's a promise in the future. So you have to split it up and put it in your business issue worksheet, so that you can visualize what you have to do. Otherwise, I you can I I can't even do it. I've been doing this for 15 years. I use a business issue worksheet. Okay. So uh, you have to stay, so, so that's why I say stay focused on what we have to do. Then later on, you can put, do all the bells and whistles. But there's so many things to stay focused on that let's get, let's check off these first. Okay. So if, so see now I have in my I have my representation I got my representation and warranty from number five. So 
Ralph LP is a sole owner of the Ralph trademark image and has a sole right to license the right to use the Ralph trademark image. As of the date of this agreement, no individual or entity other than merchandisers has the right or, or, or license to manufacture, market, or sell caps and t-shirts bearing the Ralph trademark in the license territory. See, I know what that is for whatever purpose it's supposed to apply to. I don't necessarily need to, I just need to let it work its own magic. Rather than, uh, now if I hand it over to merchandiser's attorney and he says, oh no, oh no, I, I want you to put a provision in here that Ralph will terminate. If he has any other uh, licenses to anybody else, once I am able to expand to this expanded territory, then I want you to put a provision in there. I have to let merchandisers take care of that because I haven't yet been asked to do that by my client yet. You see? This, these are the only, yeah, these are the only things that are in there. I must, have, I must have had a dream. You, all I'm saying is, you got to stay focused on what you're actually being asked to do, and not give it more than you need to. For, because we represent Ralph LP. So we don't need to, you know, give it a lot of oomph for merchandise's benefit. Although, it's, you know. Okay. So then conditions to close. Now, obviously, uh, It is just a checklist. Again, conditions to closings. The condition to closing section has nothing to do with the concept conditions. And it has nothing to do with closing. Like closing date. It has nothing to do with that. It's a checklist. It's really a checklist to make sure that the party's obligations have been fulfilled before consummating the transaction. And so that is, uh, somebody said, are de other deliveries similar to conditions to closing? No. I think we're asking that question because of the closing deliveries, but it has n deliveries, it has nothing to do with condition of closing has nothing to do with closing. So uh, deliveries has nothing to do with that either. Are they actual things that must be delivered? They are the documents that are associated with the consideration. In some respect, you know, sometimes, you know, it's up to the parties, but that's not what I'm, I'm more concerned with the con I'm concerned with the consideration, the documents associated with the consideration. So that is what we're looking at when we're talking about conditions to closings. Okay, so now I want to move into the discussion about the general provisions. Okay, so these are some of the provisions that you will find in the general provisions section of the agreement. Okay, they're going to be uh, anti-assignment, anti-delegation, uh, provisions that deal with successors and assigns to the agreement, the governing law, choice of law. Waiver of right to jury trial, the notice provisions, 
severability, no oral amendments, merger integration provisions, and counterparts provisions. These are just some uh, housekeeping type of provisions that you need in the agreement. And so I'm going to look at the super cool. If somebody told you they want to sell you a super cool stone, would you be racing to buy it? I mean, that, <laughs> it's cool. It's not hot. <laughs> but it's a super cool. I want to try to give me a little cartoon. It's like a little, car, it's a stove, but it's like he's like cool. He's a cool guy. Yes, ma'am. Uh, general provisions are just boilerplate provisions, right? So uh, yeah. Boilerplate. Well, I don't want to call it just boilerplate because they can be very important. And when you when I say, I want to be careful when I say boilerplate because some people, when I say boilerplate, they'll go look for the sample. And I still need to be focused like a laser on the client's goals when I am drafting these uh, general provisions. And I'm just going to give a clue and say, you know, especially for transaction three, they may be very seminal. Some of the things have to relate to certain of these uh, general provisions. So you just don't want to, you have to be mindful still about what the wording is of them but eh, so to speak kind of i don't want to say boilerplate i don't like boilerplate <laughs> i because i want you to still look because you still have to look into the uh goals of the client especially here and uh assignment and delegation okay provisions detailing uh regarding assignment and our delegation of rights okay Rights and our obligations may be found in this general provision section of the agreement. Okay, so a party may, okay, so we have obligations. Okay, uh, the landlord shall heat the premises and the tenant shall have the right to have the uh, premises heated. Okay, so it's, an, you know, it's up to the party the particular client's goals on whether or not you would want to assign that right to somebody else. A party may assign a right to somebody else. Also, a party may delegate, delegate their obligation to perform. The landlord could delegate its obligation to heat the premises. And so remember, we talked about this early on, uh, the covenants and the flip side of that being the right. An assignment is a transfer of that right to a third party. And so when you assign that right, then that person becomes the asinore, the person that is assigning the right. And then the person to whom the right is assigned is the assignee or assignee. The party who, who has the obligation is the non-assigning party. So here, Leslie has an obligation to pay Ibrahim $100. So then Ibrahim is going to have the right to receive that $100 from Leslie. Not from Simon, not from anybody else. He has the right to receive that from Leslie. And so Abraham may assign that right to a third party. And so now Mark has the right to receive that $100 from Leslie. In addition, Leslie then has an obligation to pay Ibrahim. So since Ibrahim has assigned his right, Leslie now becomes the, not the non-assigning party and Ibra uh, Mark becomes the assignee. 
Once Abraham assigns his right, he no longer has that right to Leslie's performance. In addition, a party delegates this obligation when it appoints someone else to carry out its obligation or to perform on its behalf. The party who delegates its obligation is the delegating party and the third party person to whom the obligation is delegated is the delegate. Okay, so Abraham has an obligation to deliver two boxes of multi-purpose paper to Leslie. Abraham may delegate this obligation to Mark now. So then if that happens, then Mark now has the obligation to deliver the paper to Leslie. Okay, but delegation alone will not bind this party to uh, perform in favor of the non-delegating party. Assuming the obligation is delegable, the delegate must agree with the delegating party that it will perform in favor of the non-delegating party. And so that is why you will see that we have these anti assignment and anti-delegation provisions because these are provisions in the agreement based on the client's goals. You would have to look at the client's goals and determine whether it will be beneficial to the client to have an anti a provision in the agreement that does not allow a party to assign a right or a provision in the agreement that would not allow a party to delegate an obligation to somebody else. You would have to look at the facts and determine whether that would be to the, to the, to the client's benefits. If it is, if it would be beneficial to the client to have a right assigned, then would you need an anti-assignment provision? No. You would not need an anti-assignment provision because you're fine. It may be to the client's benefit to have a particular right assigned. Okay? So that is the point of uh, the anti-assignment and anti-delegation provisions in the agreement. And so I don't want to necessarily... I don't want to say that it would be boilerplate, so to speak, because you still need to uh, be mindful of the client's goals and you may need to word it in a way that goes against just regular boilerplate. But once the parties do enter into that uh, delegation agreement, once it does, the non-delegating party becomes a third party beneficiary of that assumption of that obligation. So when Mark assumes Ibrahim's duty to perform the obligation in favor of Leslie, Mark becomes obligated now to deliver to Leslie the two boxes of multi-purpose paper and Leslie has the right to that performance. This is, these are anti-delegation provisions. So the fact of the matter is that obligation is not gonna flow from the agreement that's being drafted. T to delegate is allowable. If there is an anti-delegation provision in the agreement, then a party cannot go off and do something like this. Because the agreement specifically says that this is not allowed under the agreement. Are there any questions about that? So if a party does not want a right to be assigned here, she would insert uh, an anti-assignment uh, provision.
But again, I mean, it could be beneficial. So you need to be looking at the client's goals to see if this is something that they might like to have. You want to draft the anti-assignment provision to prohibit assignment of rights under the agreement and not merely the assignment of the agreement as a whole, okay? So this really does go to a particular right or obligation. Uh, you know, sometimes a person wants to take an agreement, I guess, and just assign the whole thing to someone else. We're talking about specific contract concepts here. And then delegation can be tailored by requiring the delegation to be subject to conditions. Condition on the delegate must be credit worthy. Uh, if somebody wanted to delegate an obligation to pay, well, uh, that would be condition on the uh, uh, on whether or not that particular delegate has the credit worthiness to take on that obligation. And so now once Abraham. Uh, has delegated this obligation to Mark, then now he wants to take, he wants to obtain some type of release from its obligation to continue on that obligation because now that has been delegated to someone else. These are all items that take place outside of the agreement, outside of the agreement that we're talking about. These are things to think about in determining whether or not it is beneficial to the client's goals to include an anti-assignment or an anti-delegation agreement in the provision. And so you're always wanting to look at your deal memo, your term sheet, your uh, issues of client concern. And uh, after doing so, uh, you want to review all the covenants to determine the existing obligations and rights because that is where uh, this type of uh, uh, provision is going to flow. So you want to go back and look at them and determine whether or not there is something there that you would strongly not want to have delegated. And so, where is the first place you're going to look then? The first place you're going to look. The first place you're going to go to review a covenant to determine if it should be assigned or delegated. Yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yes, the subject matter performance provision. It is where the major, major, major covenants in the agreement is contained. And so I'm looking over here at our super cool stove deal. And I'm looking at my, uh, my deal memo term sheet. And I'm gonna go back through my agreement that first being the uh, subject matter performance provision. But in that stove purchase transaction, what was the client's main goal is to make as much money as possible and to avoid incurring liability and he wanted to make room for that new stove.
I mean, that, I didn't make that up. And so now that we have reviewed that, we want to review the covenants in the agreement to determine the existing obligations and rights. And so now, based on what I have stated, we're uh, dealing with assignments of these two. We're mostly concerned with which. When we're dealing with assignments, what are we most concerned with? We're assigning what? Rights. Yes, you all are getting it. Because when it comes right off the head like that, that means you're getting it. Rights. Our client's rights. Okay. Okay. And so if we're going to review the covenants in the agreement to determine the existing obligations and rights, the first one we're going to review is that subject matter performance provision. And when I go to that subject matter performance provision, I'm going to be looking for what? You just told me. Right. All right. Well, I have to say it that way because it's going to be a covenant. Okay, so it's going to be an obligation. So then I have to look at the flip side of it to determine what the right is. And so what is the right here? Our client's right. Money. And that's why I like to state it in such terms, shall buy the stove by paying the purchase price to whoever because now that lets me know right then and there that that is the right now of restaurants. So is this a right that restaurants would want to assign? That's the question. And so you want to ask yourself, is it? Would restaurants want to assign its right to receive the $29,000 to somebody else? Maybe not. Because his main goal was what? To receive the money. <laughs> now, okay, well, let's say uh, well, let's say he needed to pay off, I'm just saying, suppose he needed to pay off the uh, old stove or he needed to pay off something. Would he want to assign that right to receive that money, maybe, to somebody else to pay off a debt? Possibly. But we don't have those facts. But the fact of the matter is, would it, do we need to have an anti-assignment provision? Probably not. That gives, that, that, he, that gives them more flexibility. So we may not need an, an anti-assignment provision for that agreement. So what I am saying to you is that when you ask me the question, is it boilerplate, what I want to say to you is, I don't want to see a whole bunch of agreements that just have a whole bunch of general provisions just for the sake of having them because it may not it may not relate to your deal. Okay. There actually were a few people who maybe they were just saying some people said they enjoyed the transaction too. I'm serious. 
At least one or two people did say that. Because it's fun. I think it's fun. Uh, no? Okay. That's challenging. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot of fun because listen, okay, so just think about that. You know, think about, I mean, everything you have to kind of think about it. Uh, and even with this uh, anti assignment, you know, again, we're saying that it's not a uh, assignment of the agreement as a whole. Uh, it's a certain rights, okay? So, I mean, you would want to ask yourself, now, I don't represent merchandisers, but would merchandisers want any, uh, are there at least some rights that merchandisers wouldn't want to assign in the agreement? <clears throat> you would ask yourself that. Merchandisers. If we were their attorney. If you were their attorney. Yeah. What is the main right? The main right that merchandisers has in Ralph's deal? To market and sell the Right. Would 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 he would he want that to be assigned? So merchandisers might come back with a draft that says maybe I don't know that's why it can't be boilerplate it may be that there may be some anti-assignment regarding that particular right from merchandisers perspective so you have to be looking at the goal of the client that's just an example though I mean it just depends on who the client is dealt with that. Okay, what about an anti-delegation provision? Assuming Pilar's obligation to pay the $29,000 is delegable, the delegate must agree with the delegating party that it will perform in favor of the non-delegating party. So, assuming Pilar's obligation to pay is delegable. Okay, and once it does, the non-delegating party becomes a third party beneficiary of that assumption. So when the delegate assumes Pilar's duty to perform that obligation in favor of restaurants, the delegate becomes obligated to deliver to restaurants that $29,000. And then instead of Pilar's, restaurant then has the right to receive that $29,000 from that delegate at that point. So would restaurants have a greater risk if Pilar's delegates its obligation, its performance to pay that $29,000 at its own discretion? Would restaurants have a greater risk? Restaurants, in that particular case, which is our client, would they have a greater risk if Pilar's could delegate that obligation, which it would be able to do if there's no anti-delegation provision. Does this cause greater risk? These are questions that you should be asking. Instead of a full anti-delegation provision, 
could restaurants subject delegation to a condition, i.e. pillars may delegate its obligation to pay the purchase price on condition that that delegate must be credit worthy. So these are, uh, that's why I want to make sure I don't just give a blanket answer to the question of whether or not this is going to be boilerplate because it is based on the facts that we're given. Uh, all right, so successes and assigns. And so these are also included in the uh, general provisions. These are people who would have rights to the agreement uh, in the event that uh, there are some facts that make, uh, make the, uh, the parties, the parties who have the obligations and rights under the contract, maybe there's some death or some other type of uh, situation to where there may be a uh, successor to that agreement. Those are also placed in the general provisions uh, section of the agreement. Also, we have our choice of law. And so we go to our deal memo, our client email, something is going to give us information about choice of law. And so then that is critical to be included in the general provisions because it is going to dictate where any lawsuits that may arise as a result of the agreement are venued. Uh, the state uh, where the, those lawsuits uh, could take place. That's where the choice of law uh, tends to uh, be dealing with. And so here, you know, when you're looking at this, for example, uh, this was Lenny's deal and we had uh, information leading us to the conclusion that these are California entities. So in this particular case, what would the choice of law be for this type of agreement, for this particular agreement? Yes, ma'am. In the state of California. Now, uh, in Ralph's deal, we're given different facts. But since that may be information that is up for future assignments, I'm going to let you deal with that. But these are the types of things that we're looking for in our uh, deal materials that will make up the information that we put in our agreement. That's why I say I like to use a deal memo because I like to put everything that I'm going to need in one place. So I don't have to keep going back to the transaction materials. It's all scattered out in three or four different pages. I have all, I put all of my stuff together. And then there's also the waiver of a right to a jury trial. Uh, it may be some type of a, a case or a deal where this may be something that the client may want to have. And so if that is the case, then you would put this, put this in the general uh, provisions portion of the agreement. But now, if there is some type of a arbitration clause or something like that, would now would you need a waiver to write to jury provision in the agreement? Probably not. So, you know, I'm looking for these types of things when I'm going through the agreement because it, it shows me whether there's just stuff in there just for the sake of having it or if there's some thought that is in place when uh, the person is 
putting together that agreement. And then the notice provision. Now the notice provision is very, very, very important. Very important. Because there will be things that will, uh, you know, like earlier I talked to you about Ralph's deal. And I said, oh, when that first payment comes due and I go and I look at my bank account and I don't have my direct deposit, is not in there, I'm going to need to send a notice. And it is specifically there are certain things that must be in that notice provision I'm going to be looking for. And so uh, you want to have your notice provision in the general provisions section of the agreement. It must state the method and that method should be in writing. Because that just makes sure that everybody is, because somebody just, they say, oh, I called you, remember? <laughs> no. It, notice needs to be in writing. And then you want to insist that the risk of non-receipt will be borne by the sender. And so uh, you want to include a provision that says notice then, number one, is going to be in writing. And then it's going to be effective only on receipt. So how are you going to know they received it? Then you need to make sure that you're sending it in a certain method. like to use certified mail because once that is sent I know when it's received I go over there to USPS.com put in my little tracking number some people like fax maybe FedEx you have a tracking number but you but since since it's born by the person sending Then you want to make sure that you're sending it in a method that you can certify its receipt. I wouldn't do email. I mean, because, you know, it's kind of squishy on being able to prove that. But, I, but, but you can. I mean, these days, I mean, you know, things, we, we're moving. But I personally, I send something by, when I want to get somebody's attention, I send that thing by certified mail with a green card, the old-fashioned way. When I want them to know I mean business, that I'm not playing with them, I send it by certified mail. That lets them, see, once I, once I mess with you on the telephone, I'm doing my emails, nothing is happening. When I send that thing to you on my office letterhead, Law Offices of Dana T. Blackmore, certified mail, return receipt requested, tracking number 0004, that lets you know. They be ringing my phone the next day once they get that. Because they, they know I'm one step into the courthouse now. I'm just laying the foundation because I'm about to sue you. And so then all kinds of, you know, I get all kinds of response then. And be like, oh, oh, I didn't even know you existed. Oh, now when you send that thing in writing. Okay. So these are the things that I would be looking for in that notice provision. Okay. And then severability. The purpose of a severability provision is to express the party's intent that a court will enforce the valid provisions even if there are some portions of the agreement that may not be so valid. That the court won't say, oh, this thing is void altogether. The severability provision will say that the court will enforce the valid provisions even if there are, you know, one or two things that are, that just, you know, just kind of brush up against the bounds of the law. The rest of the agreement is still good. That the entire agreement will not be invalidated. So this is your severability provision. 
And then you will have your no oral amendments provision. The purpose of a no oral amendments provision is to express that the party's intent that the agreement may not be amended except only by a written agreement. And then you have your merger inter integration provision used when there is failure of a meeting of the minds to ensure that parole evidence cannot be used to supplement what the parties truly intended within the four corners of the agreement. It should state that the agreement is the final and exclusive expression of the party's agreement and will be fully integrated. If it merely states that it is a final expression of the party's agreement, it is partially integrated. And so you would want it to say, state that the agreement is a full and exclusive expression of the party's agreement and will be fully integrated. And so when there are vague provisions, which I like to stay away from, I like to make sure that everything is stated that you know it's clear what the intent is but that the court cannot then go outside of the four corners of the agreement this is what it meant and then we have our counterparts provision now this is used when you have an agreement and like I sign it, then I send it over to somebody else, they sign it and send it back. Then all of the parts create the full agreement. Even though you don't have both signatures on this one page, the counterpart is the other page that the other party signed. It all together makes the full agreement. So this provides for the ability to do that. Sometimes, you know, somebody will sign it, they'll get their client, you got to go get your client, your client signs and their client, they're not, everybody's not, there's no closing, so to speak. And so there may be a need to use counterpart. So you want to have a uh, provision that would make those counterpart parts valid to make up the entire agreement. That's the purpose of that provision. Okay. Now, I want to talk a little bit, just a little bit, just, I'm not going to hold it long. That, are there any questions about the general provisions? Because now I want to go into just a small discussion about due diligence, because now we're in the due diligence phase of transaction two. Okay. So now what... Uh, the parties should be doing is working on making sure what is is taking place at this point in time. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, because and not just inspections. Let me just say due diligence. It includes inspections. What else are we inspecting? Yes, ma'am. Uh, y yes, yes, definitely. Um, what else is critical, though? Yes, ma'am. Um, the person we're buying the ski lift from has all the right financial records and everything, too. And definitely, title. definitely. And when you say title, what do you mean? Yes. <laughs> Lesson why I'm saying this, because there was a big discussion last semester. I, I think people took offense. When I, there is no title for a ski lift, okay? So when, you, so when you say good title, if you're saying good title in your agreement, that's fine. But I don't want to see somebody thinking that there will be some document 
a title that would be attached as an exhibit because you're not going to go down to the DMV and find a title for the ski lift. The, we, not all things that are sold have titles. A house will have a title, a car, these types of things, but not a ski lift. And so what would be the operating document for a ski lift then for ownership? A bill of sale. But if I see a title attached, then that tells me you don't have a deep understanding of the deal. Okay, so uh, so we're looking for uh, uh, what did you say? Financial or uh, title? You know, records that will show ownership. Okay, definitely. What other types of things are we looking for? Yes, ma'am. Well, I know we were saying that there's another um, group of people who are going to fight into an interest in the ski lift. Absolutely. So are you trying to find out? I don't know what that Absolutely. is. Absolutely. You're trying to do what? Trying to find out what? That they're not going to have any, that that interest is going to stop you from owning the ski lift outright. And how are you going to do, how are you going to make sure of that? That's what you have to do in this deal. You may have to do what? You may have to, because, because. Yes, sir. Just going back to the title. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Which is looped into this, but go ahead. When, when, when somebody has a lien on uh, uh, yes, his property. Yes. I can't really say much because this is still in play, but yes, yes, I don't know, but yes, things have to be done. Due diligence. This is due diligence. This is included in due diligence. Whatever it is you got to do to make it, because, because when we go pick up the ski lift, we, we, can't nobody else own it, right? Because it's <laughs> that'd be a shame. You know what I'm saying? This big old thing. I mean, you get it over there to your place and then find out. <laughs> Not the kind that you would record at the DMV. Right, right, right. But don't they have to transfer their claim? How is it going to get transferred, though? What? what how, how, how is that going to happen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, but why? How? How would? You, how would that happen? You gonna do what? No, no, it's got to be sorted out. Okay, but when? But when does that have to take place? Before, yes, in this case, closing. Anyway, at any, at any rate, that is a part of due diligence. What else is included? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about that. Would you then want to identify yourself saying if they come after you, that party has other interests, then... Well, I just think that that's a good question, really. I mean, I can't really get, get into it, but I'm telling you, I would pursue that. <laughs> but you got to fix the problem. You got to fix the problem. And, and included in fixing the problem, you have to make it worth other people's while <laughs> that they know you mean business. So, yes, that may be a way to do that. But you you we can't go once we walk once we once the time is stated for delivery, all of this has to be cleared up. Yeah. So, um 
you know, so now we, these are all things I'm hoping that we're, you know, thinking about because now we're going to have draft two. We're going to put all the pieces together uh, at this point. But what else do we want to make sure of during this time period? Yes, ma'am. Okay, but there are there what else what else is included in due diligence? Yes. Well there's the feasibility report we need to get. Uh all kinds of things. <laughs> okay. All right. So let me say this. Okay. So, what else is included in that? In due diligence, making sure of what? Oh, let me go back. This is the slide. Did you see any of these things in that? Uh, reading of due diligence there was some handouts out there so could any of these be applicable legal intellectual property not just the inspection that we have been talked to uh, that we were told uh, about but these are all things that will be included. You want to go back and make sure there are not any prior lawsuits or anything that may be, or any claims that, so these are all things that are included in this particular uh, transaction. Because once you buy it, it's yours. You may be buying a whole lot of things that come along with it. But our job is to fix problems. Okay. Are there any questions about this? There was a handout in the, this is an article that I wrote many years ago about uh, Blackberry, there are patent trolls. There are, uh, there could be, uh, you know, people who are just out uh, in the atmosphere and they will uh, patent something that they never have the they have no intention of ever using but the minute somebody uses that thing then they're going to file a lawsuit against them for infringement on their rights and so these are the types of things that you have to go back into and that's where we were talking about the intellectual property uh, rights this was a situation here where they made a very crafty argument here with this BlackBerry thing because Research in Motion really is a Canadian company. And so they said that they could not be held liable for patent infringement because the infringing activity took place outside of the United States. This is back in the day when we had Blackberries in the relay. The, all the emails went through outside to Canada and came back into the person's pocket to their uh, handheld device. And so anyway, at the end of the day, they ended up having to, uh, to settle this case for many, many millions of dollars, okay? And so here we have been provided with this uh, letter that we have received regarding uh, some patent troll has, we, we found this in the file. 
that somebody wrote a letter uh, making a claim. And so if there's something like this, now this is just this is just for us to talk about here in class. I'm not, this is not for you to go rummaging through for this deal. These are just things to think about though, uh, where you may have some types of, any type of, so it, let's say there are some things like that. That may be something in the agreement you wanna make sure, that may be a problem, you wanna make sure you fix to make sure that if somebody sent uh, a letter to uh, the prior owner of the ski lift some years ago about some type of patent infringement and he just put it in the desk drawer, well, that's an outstanding claim that may go with the ski lift when it is purchased. So these are all the types of things that have to be researched during the due diligence period. And so what if you miss something? What would you do? So it may be a problem that may have a way to be fixed in the agreement. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So that's what our job is uh, to make sure that these are all the kinds of things that we're doing uh, throughout this process. Now, so what I would suggest is that we, you know, this is what I have been saying all along is, see now uh, we have our assignment for this week uh, would be the uh, general provisions, I believe. So along with that, if I were you, I would start working on the general provisions section for transaction two. So that you're not bogged down, you know, you should be, you know, working on those as you go so that you're not, you know, behind the power curve when the thing becomes due trying to finish it, okay? Are there any questions about anything that we've talked about this evening?